hi Jamie, thanks for thanks for joining. Uh, if you could start by introducing yourself. Hello there. My name is Dr. Jamie Gordon. I work for the World Wildlife Fund's UK office, where I'm the forest advisor. Great. Uh, and um, we we just want to talk a little bit about some recent spikes in uh, Amazon deforestation. So there's some there's some numbers come out, like in the I think in the last week or stuff like that 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 showed what many people probably have feared that. Um, that the Amazon deforestation rates continue to to go up, um, and um, one of the things I heard is that that actually COVID nineteen have actually meant that that more illegal logging could could take place, and it was it was less uh, supervised. Yes, unfortunately, things aren't looking good in the Brazilian Amazon. The latest data from the National Institute for Space Research, that's INPE in in Brazil. Um, shows that there's something like, well, over 3,000 square kilometers of forests have, have, have been removed from the Amazon in the first six months of the year. Um, that's 26% up on last year, the same period. And this is before we get to the burning season, uh, which is about to be honest when things really hot up. Um, and yes, there are, um, I would say, good reason to think that the situation with COVID has made it all the more difficult because there's been, it's just simply been, it's simply more difficult to for governments to actually be effective in the Amazon when there's so much control on movement and it would appear that some people are taking advantage of that. What what would you say is the primary reason for actually the sudden spike? I mean what we should also say is that Amazon deforestation levels have always gone up but it's just like at the rate at which they're gone up right? Well actually up until quite recently there was more positive news. Um, Brazil has a decent forest legal framework called the Forest Code and it was being well enforced and deforestation rates were falling. But under the current government, this has changed. Uh, and this is long before COVID as well. Um, enforcement has fallen away and land speculators have, have moved in uh, with what appears to be impunity, typically um, clearing land for beef, for beef cattle. Um, as, and, and then as time goes on, perhaps it gets converted to other more permanent crops. But um, that's, that's prior to anything to do with COVID. And that really seemed to take off last year um, when it, it seemed like burning, which is the first stage of the clearance, really took off. And it just did not appear that the government was really even trying to enforce that. Now, this year, uh, we don't quite know how the burning season is going to go, but because we've already seen a spike before the season started, and we know things are even more complicated and difficult to control and manage because of COVID, we have to fear the worst. Absolutely. Uh, I, I guess when I talk about going up, I mean that obviously that we are the level that's covered by by forest in Amazon keeps shrinking. Uh, I, I, was, I was mainly thinking about the level of it, and and, and you're absolutely right that under Dilma Dilma's uh, administrations, they they got more to grips with it. Um, yes. So I, I I I guess that the issue is around regulations, isn't it? Because I, I know that Bolsonaro he slashed he slashed a lot of. Uh, regulation and he did he did actually say he didn't even think it was a problem yeah i mean I mean, he's obviously um an administration which is very much works in tune with the agribusiness and you know the amazon to some eyes is a land bank a place which should be converted into doing something else and worryingly uh, this is taking place as much in much in protected areas anywhere this this new spike in deforestation uh we think about 50 percent of amazonian deforest in the last three months took place in, in publicly protected lands, and that's quite scary. Um, and, and, and more in, in other public forests which are yet to be designated with any protection. Um, and we don't, what really is worrying is that we don't think the Amazon can withstand this ongoing continual loss. We, th um, we think uh, that at some point a, a, a sudden shift will occur, what we call a tipping point, yeah. when so much Amazon has been altered that it starts to convert into something much, much drier, a savanna type ecosystem with a huge loss of biodiversity and perhaps even more concerning, a huge loss of carbon, a huge amount of carbon will then be in the atmosphere. And it's difficult to see how we can tackle global climate change if the Amazon converts from what it is at the moment, if you like a friend in a sense that it should be absorbing carbon dioxide. It has, has, has been doing that for, for a long time um, it's still growing, it's still accumulating biomass, but it's now, there's now every indication it's beginning to leak on, be part of the problem we've converted, if you like, a, an ally into an enemy, which is ridiculous. 
So yeah, you talk a little about those those um, those tipping points. We know about all these like crucial tipping points to actually harm climate change, like uh, uh, Arctic ice melt is also another one of those. But we see the the forest loss is another one kind of thing. So so what are is the tipping point just meaning that at one point is irreversible? No matter what we can do beyond the tipping point, will actually bring back uh, bring back the forest and 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 it's the well, whole issue that it's becoming dry as well so it'll turn from a from a forest into a savanna essentially well whether it's irreversible is perhaps a difficult question to answer i mean mm. with enough effort enough time it's potentially reversible but i mean it could i think the point is that it's suddenly a huge part of the amazon particularly the the drier uh, um eastern end of the amazon could convert into something else which to to, to return that to, to moist forests would be very very difficult and you know, and once the carbon's in the atmosphere, it takes decades to bring that back. So I don't think there's any thought that going beyond that tipping point means never mind, we can turn it around. I mean, on a small scale restoration might be possible in some places, but you've altered the whole climate dynamics, um, the whole cycling of vapor and water and humidity, which the Amazon does. You know, a huge proportion of the water, the, fall, the rain that falls in the Amazon derives from water which is evaporated off of the Amazon. And that cycling is suddenly lost. Um, so that's why it begins to dry out. And a savanna like e ecosystem simply can't reproduce that. It continue, um, you'll get much more, much more um, distinct dry seasons. And it's difficult to see any future in which once we've gone past that tipping point, we can practically return it to, to um, close, close canopy, humid forest with all its diversity. And, and of course, the, the cultures, the people that live in there, there's 30 million people dependent on the Amazon, living in the Amazon. Yeah, yeah so when, when, the, when, the first, when the damage happens in terms of actually you, lo you lose some forest to either logging or converting into like uh, soil plantations or palm oil or, or, or cattle growing, how can that, how can then, then be turned back into forest if there is the right means to do so? Not without huge amounts of effort uh, and, and huge amounts of time. I mean, um, across the globe at the moment, there's huge interest in whether we can grow more forests to combat climate change. And that's great. And done in the right way, that's possible. But it's even more important that we conserve the forests we already have. Um, because a, a mature forest like the Amazon takes decades, if not hundreds of years, of slow growth, slowly, 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 slowly accumulating more and more and more carbon. You can't do that in any time scale, which is relevant to our fight against climate change. We've got to We've got to solve climate change in the next 30 or 40 years. Um, if we are trying to regrow the Amazon, that's a 100, 150 year prospect, <laughs> it's not, part of, not part of the answer. So across the world, when it comes to what trees and forests can do for climate change, the number one thing, the number one thing is to protect and restore the existing forests. Sure, planting forests where it's appropriate can be really useful too, but it's protection is number one. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what are the best way to actually manage a forest or a huge forest like the Amazon in terms of actually also understanding that you, you, you can't just chuck people out of the forest, you have to actually let them live sustainably in the forest. What, what are the best means of doing that? Well, I think it's, uh, I, I speak as someone who's been working in forest conservation for 30 years, and I would say that one of the hard learned lessons of forest conservation or conservation in general is it doesn't work unless you're working with and for local people and indeed indigenous people. So there's a huge amount to be done um, working with local people. It's one of the things that WDUF does in, in the Brazilian Amazon is to support what we call forest guardians, local communities who we train and support so that they can monitor their own, own land. They know how to report to the relevant authorities when things are going wrong. And this begins to create a situation where land speculators tend to feel uncomfortable working because they know they're going to be reported and, and that's you know putting a bit of power back into the hands of the people who, who genuinely have the rights to be living and working in those forests and people have a long-term interest in living and working in and beside forests obviously tend to take a long view of their protection there's they don't see it as a short-term speculation issue they see this is this is what we, we're dependent on so um working with with local communities and indigenous people is one of the number one number one answers um and yes that doesn't mean to say uh, the forest isn't being used at all. You know, it's, it's quite legitimate to be taking products, including timber, if it's done sustainably. Um, it's probably very legitimate for traditional communities to carry on hunting, as they've always done that kind of thing, and possibly clearing small areas for agriculture. That's quite that's happened in 
in the Amazon for possibly millennia. Um, so that's a, so I think local people, indigenous people, local control is one of the key things. But you know, you need a, a government that wants to work with that because it doesn't matter how much power you give to an indigenous community. Um, you know, a, a, a well-armed and well-funded land speculator arriving on your doorstep is very hard to resist. Um, so there has to be a legal framework which a government is serious about, serious about upholding as well. So I'd say those two ends, are, two ends of the argument there. So what can um, what can anyone do really? <laughs> I'm not, but but if if you a lot of this really rests within Brazilian government, right? So what what can someone like WF what, what can they actually do to actually tur turn back the tide? You know, because I understand that probably the change will have to come, change of laws and regulations to actually hold it. Well, I think one of the one of the few things that the current Brazilian government tends to listen to is its own agribusiness because it is, you know, the current government is a is a creation of agribusiness, if you like. Um, and we have seen evidence that when you um, suggest, and, and let's remember that some of the products we're talking about, beef and soy, are are exported. They're international exports. Beef, not so much to Britain, but we certainly uh, bring up, as our risky business report has shown, we bring a lot of soy into Britain um, from the Sahado, the, the ecosystem next door, next door to the Amazon. Now, if you put pressure on those businesses, they put pressure on the government. So you, we've seen this. And in the UK, we're campaigning for new measures to be included in, in the current environment bill, um, which is going through Parliament. And we're asking for a legally binding global footprint target. That will by, by that mean a target to ensure that UK supply chains are not causing deforestation and a legislative framework requiring businesses and finance institutions to prove that their supply chains and investments are not damaging the environment in general. Um, we think this is important and we actually think there's um, quite a lot of support for us in international business, particularly more responsible ends of it, because they see that as the potential to have a, have a level playing field. Because of course, one of the problems is if, if you are a good company and only want to uh, import from um, or only want to source from sustainably managed, um, sustainably managed areas, what you often find is that's more expensive. And the guy who do, and the company doesn't care sources from cheaper areas. So that's why it does need government legislation. It's very important. Um, now, the EU, uh, sorry, the Britain is, you know, a significant buyer, as I said, of soy, less so of beef from the Amazon. But of course, the more you can get the bigger players like the EU involved, and the EU is currently negotiating a trade deal with Mercosur, which includes Brazil, and that's been held up over environmental concerns. Those sort of messages will get through. So that is one area we can work. So, you know, if you, as an individual, if you want to do something, you know, ask your MP what he thinks of the new environment bill and, and whether there should be a, whether there should be a section on, on deforestation free um, supply chains. It's not. We're not without hope, but it's it's a long haul. So you 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 refer to soy here, and it's, it's soy. I, I assume is still one of the main, well, one of the last contributors of of, of deforestation. Yes. Yeah, so um, there is currently a moratorium on soy um, expansion in Brazil in, in the Brazilian Amazon, which is important. It is, of course, something which we're deeply concerned about. That agribusiness might want to try and change that. Although you know they've had messages from UK companies recently saying, don't do that, <laughs> won't buy it from you. Um, but it is, if you take, for example, the state of Mato Grosso um, in Brazil, that's kind of very roughly speaking, half Amazon, half Sahado. It's one of the big soy producers. And you know perfectly well the soy producers there are looking at the Amazon. But the Sahado itself is a valuable, really important ecosystem we need to conserve anyway. So soy is a very big driver across uh, Brazilian ecosystems, Probably um, beef cattle ex expansion is still the number one in the, in the Brazilian Amazon, but it's, it's very complicated. Other factors come into this as well. Uh, factors like infrastructure. You know, if you put a new road into the Amazon, that helps, helps people get in, helps speculators get in, helps loggers and all, and all the like. And mining is quite a big, important issue um, because mining sometimes doesn't necessarily clear vast areas of land, but it contaminates rivers and contaminates soil and does a lot lot less obvious damage as well. So there's a, whole, there's a whole group of actors here. What we don't have very strongly in the Amazon at the moment is palm oil. And in fact, the palm oil that has begun to be produced in Latin America to, to date is actually going into places 
which is which are already deforested so there's just a possibility that latin america might become a good supplier of palm oil but that's a long way they're a long way off sort of matching the southeast asian producers for that so um soy is super important across the board um beef remains super important as a driver of, Am of amazonian destruction and uh if if we take the assumption that the world relies on on soy products and we're not gonna ease our addiction to soy any anytime soon uh as it's also a replacement product for many for many meat products but also at the same time it it, it also feeds uh, animal feed <laughs> to like many parts in the europe and the us um can it then be can you then could you then grow soy at a at a mass scale like sustainable and it, I, I assume it doesn't need to be grown in Amazon region. It could be grown anywhere. No, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is this is one of the problems with with soy. If you, if you want to change our use of soy, you you ninety percent of soy that comes to Britain goes into animal feed, so we don't even see it. We don't know. It. We, you know, a chicken doesn't come labelled X percent soy, so you can't choose not to eat it. Of course, you could choose not to reduce the amount of, of meat you're eating in your diet, and that is definitely a, a plus uh, for the environment. In the Sahara, it's a really interesting question, because in the Sahara, our, um, the way we are campaigning, the way we're working to save the Sahara is to say, look, there's enough areas of already degraded Sahara land, which has been used for soy and exhausted and could be brought back into production to satisfy the, the soy production demand that we foresee in the immediate future without clearing another single centimeter of Sahara. Now that's complicated by the fact we've got to, you know, put some effort into restoring and rehabilitating Sahara and Sahara soils, but we don't have to be clearing more land to create more uh, in Brazil to produce more soy. There is enough available land if we rehabilitate it. But it is also a good point. I mean, you know, there's, you know, if you put, you know, pressure on Brazilian producers and Brazilian producers start finding that they're finding it hard because of the rules and regulations in, in Brazil, it, you know, that doesn't mean to say that demand has gone away, it just shifts to somewhere else. And this is one of the really complicated problems we have in, in if you like, reforming our food system, which we have to do. It's the big driver of, of habitat extraction across the world, is that you can't just say, no, we're not going to take that product from there because the demand doesn't go away. Actually, you know, despite the fact we're painting soy as, you know, as a kind of a bad thing here, it's, it is very productive. You know, you get a lot from a square, you know, from a hectare of soy. So we want our, our global food system as it is co currently constituted needs soy. So it's better that we get, we do that places where you don't have to destroy forest to do it or savanna or whatever, but you can do it at quite a high productivity. You know, there's a place for soy production in the Brazilian economy without a shadow of a doubt. You haven't seen the impacts and, and working on it. Um, what, what, what do you think is the most effective ways of actually raising the issue of, of deforestation because i think like when people see images of deforestation they get all very concerned but then they don't actually understand the root causes of it so they don't understand the majority of food they eat as there's soy there's soy in them so how can you actually how can you fill that truth so people actually understand the whole uh, yeah. the whole global food system and and, and the impacts it's, it's complicated it's complicated um and I learn every day a bit more about the complications of it, you know, and, it, and it's, I'm a professional, I'm supposed to know about these things. I do think there's been a change, though. I think the reaction of the public to, to the Amazon fires last year was exceptional across the globe. You know, it's might not, people might not have understood clearly the whole dynamics behind it, but there was a real wide, wide, worldwide concern. I mean, I was, I was in Columbia at the time and everything in the, in the Columbia media was about Am Amazon destruction. You know, watching international news, it was on the international news, got back to Britain, it was, everyone was talking about it. So there is hope there. Um, now, simplistically, you can turn that into donations for environmental organisations, and that's great. I think perhaps one of the things which has most surprised me over the way we look at these things over the last few years is how the idea that eating or reducing the amount of meat you eat could be good for the environment. I mean, I, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, working in, in environmental issues, we didn't, we didn't talk about diet. You know, we didn't talk about food at all. I think most people now have an idea that there's a relationship between what they eat and how land gets managed, both in Britain and abroad. So I think there is some hope there. And certainly, um, the more we can encourage people engaged in, in 
asking questions about their diet and changing their diet, I think the better. I would love to see something similar around, uh, around, around flying. Um, I think people are conscious, but they don't quite know how to, how to not, not fly at the moment, um, that kind of thing. So I don't think without help, I don't think without, we are not without um, hope. And I think a, there is a, an engaged public which wants to know more and is concerned. Um, and I would also say to anyone in Britain that, you know, there's things we can do in this country which are good too. You know, we can restore ecosystems here. We can ask questions about how our agriculture is here, you know, as well as making those diet choices. But the fact it is complicated. It is complicated explaining the relationship between uh, building roads and uh, land speculation and the beef and leather industry and where soy comes into it and all that. It, it, I'm afraid it is. Um, if it was really, really simple, we might have solved it. Um, even, even where we're working in the Amazon with governments who, let's say, are much more pro-conservation, let's put it that way, that doesn't mean to say it's easy. You know, uh, we do great work in, in Colombia, for example, and in Peru with governments who are much more keen uh, to get on top of deforestation, to, um, you know, to preserve the Amazon, but they still have huge challenges about how to, you know, how to extend governments into these distant places and uh, how to, you know, how to con how to confront um, narco traffickers and all that kind of stuff. It is not, it isn't simple, I'm afraid. It just isn't. But there are things we can do without a shadow of a doubt. And 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 then finally, what what would success look like for you? And 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 what what should we aim to? get to in the next few years and decades and and are you hopeful you might get there <laughs> i'm going to say i'm hopeful i'm not necessarily going to give you a load of evidence for that hope but i am hopeful I have to be hopeful we have to be um what does good look like well if i go back to this idea that the amazon and possibly other ecosystems have tipping points then we need to know what that tipping point is how much more of the amazon can we lose and make sure we don't lose that much more. Some, some scientists have said it could be as little as 5% more we have, we, 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 before we have this fundamental change. So in that case, good looks like that not happening. I think it also looks like a lot more local control over forest resources in the Amazon, because I think that's a step forward. Um, I think it looks like a lot more um, responsible purchasing of commodities from, well, from everywhere, including the Amazon. I th we, we talked about that briefly in terms of what we want in the UK Environment Bill on sustainable sourcing. And um, I think on top of all of that, I think we just need uh, to understand much more clearly that the, the, big, face, the big challenges we face not, uh, aren't just about feeding uh, an ever more demanding population. It's not just about combating climate change. It's actually about having um, the natural infrastructure which keeps this planet running intact so you could for example you know be our, some places like this hardo there is a real strong um, role there for rehabilitation and restoration of, of landscapes i think in the amazon it's still primarily about stopping destruction perhaps locally some restoration that could be very important but in other in other in other ecosystems i think it's about you know let's build back nature that's what we really need as well. So you, you mentioned uh, writing to your MP and stuff like that. So people who, who watching are getting really concerned. Apart from writing to the MP, is there any other point of action an individual can take? Um, well, I mean, if you're, if you're so inclined, you know, be part of these protest movements that have grown up. Peaceful protest is what we can do in Britain. And I think it's, again, uh, that's another surprise how... how protests about these issues have become mainstream so join that mps do this i was talking to my own mp just recently and i was surprised how much how perhaps i should have been i felt surprised at how engaged he was in the issue of climate change and, and, and forest protection not necessarily 100 percent convinced he's going to do the right things about it but he is engaged so you know people are listening um i think we are we all now have a voice via social media um, use that, use that in a positive, polite and constructive way, do that too. Um, and in the UK, we're blessed with a lot of different types uh, of environmental organisation, not just the World Wide Fund, there's, there's lots and there's one to your taste out there, you know, join, be a supporter. Okay, thanks a lot, Jamie. Become part, of, become part of the fight as well, you know. <laughs> thanks, Jamie, no doubt. Bye. Pleasure speaking to you. And uh, good, good, keep up the good work.